I really miss all the other people that are being oh. yeah. well, we could bring back in. I was sitting back and said, look at all those young people I could preach to today. Now they're all leaving. <laughs> we could make a yeah. yeah, it wouldn't bother me as much as it would the parents, huh? <laughs> Keep them still, quiet. Well, good morning. Good morning. It's always worth it after a drive down here. It's always worth it to be, to be here and to see you and uh, the eagerness with which you come and hear the word of God. It's, uh, and I also appreciate the music and I appreciate the, uh, the fact that people enter into that with a joyful noise. This is going to be my last message in Colossians. Next week I won't be here because I'm going to be having a cataract surgery on my right eye tomorrow morning. And they say that the, the, the time of recuperation and getting uh, new lenses that will work for me to try to read and so forth uh, may take up to a week. So we won't be here next Sunday. So I'm glad that it worked out this way that I could finish this today. When I preached this in the past, I actually broke it up into two sermons, but um, decided that I think it would be better to bring it all to a close in one message. So I redid the outline and everything, and uh, it's about personal evangelism. My first uh, year at Biola University um, was a required course. We took a class called Personal Evangelism. I still have the textbook that we use. Now, that's different than mass evangelism. Many times when we hear the word evangelist or evangelism, we think of somebody standing up in front of a large crowd and preaching the gospel. And it's a monologue. It's not a dialogue. It's just one person preaching to a bunch of other people. And there's a place for that. Um, Jesus did that. Uh, Paul did that. Billy Graham does that or did that. So there's a place for that. But personal evangelism is really the means that God uses to advance the gospel throughout the world. Did you know that the Roman Empire within two centuries was, quote, conquered by Christianity through the slave trade? Slaves would come to Christ and they would share the gospel with fellow slaves and as they were so bought and sold and transferred all over the Roman Empire, Christianity spread without missionaries. Now, Paul was a missionary and many of the churches he established they also sent out missionaries, and I'm not minimizing that, but I'm just trying to tell you that the, the bread and butter of Christianity, the basics of Christianity have to do with personal evangelism. One person sharing with another person. And that's what this is really about, if you'll look at this. First of all, in verse 2, he gives a command to devote yourselves to prayer. Now, I, I noticed this morning when Frank read it, it says, continue. Well, the Apostle Paul in Colossians 1, 9 to 12 says, I have not stopped praying for you. So continuing is part of this, but this is an intensified form of the word, uh, which means be strong for it. This should be a priority in which we persevere. We are to be strong in this area of prayer with regard to God opening opportunities for evangelism. This week, I think starting Tuesday, Gail said we have the um, Vacation Bible School in Elk Creek. If you have not already prayed about what you might do as part of that ministry, at least pray that God would open opportunities for people, for children, all kinds of people, parents, to hear the gospel and be saved as a result of this week of Vacation Bible School. You and I have an obligation to support those who are preaching the gospel, teaching the gospel, sharing the gospel, whatever word you want to use. We have an obligation to support them in prayer. So he says, devote yourselves to prayer. Make it a priority and persevere in it. Keeping alert literally means keeping awake. Remember when Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane, he would come back, and he asked his disciples to pray with him. And he comes back and they're sound asleep. Wake up! See, they had no idea what was about to happen. That the Romans were going to come out and arrest Jesus and the disciples would flee for their lives 
They didn't know what was about that. And we don't know from day to day what's going to happen. We don't know. And so we have to be careful to stay awake, spiritually alert, not listless, mechanical, half-hearted prayers. One of the hazards or the, um, what's, the what's the word? One of the, uh, when you're in the ministry, you pray a lot. You pray publicly a lot. And it's very easy at home or um, occupational hazard is what I was trying to say. It's easy to get into a routine and say the same thing over and over and over and over again repetitiously without even thinking about what you're saying. Whether it's at the dinner table or whether it's in the pulpit, it doesn't matter. That's not prayer. Prayer is you're engaged. You're focused. You're specific in what you're asking for. You're praying. You're awake. You're not just going through the motions mechanically saying the same thing over and over and over again. <clears throat> and he says, uh, do it with an attitude of thanksgiving. So we ought to be awake, and we ought to be thankful for the fact that we can ask God for things, and that we can expect Him to meet needs that we ask Him to meet. And so we do this with thanksgiving. Praying at the same time for us as well. Paul, his associates, Timothy and Epaphras, are with him, and he asks for prayer for the church in Colossae, for them, that God will open to us a door for the word. Now, <clears throat> God opens doors for the gospel. The reason that the gospel is still being preached, the reason that the whole world practically has heard the gospel is because God opens doors. When he closed the doors in one country and they're kicked out of China, a lot of those missionaries went to other places in the world. I had a teacher at Biola that was a missionary in China when the Communist Revolution took place, and the missionaries were all kicked out. Did that end Christianity in China? No. The church went underground. And years later, some of those missionaries were able to go back and find out that they were healthy, vibrant churches meeting underground. Because the seed had been sown by those missionaries in those days. So, God opens doors and he closes doors. Paul's request for prayer is while he is in prison in Rome, so he's curtailed in his ability to get out and preach to people, but his one consuming interest was for the advancement of the gospel. He didn't ask for prayer for his acquittal and release from prison. I'm sure he wanted that, and I'm sure the church prayed for that. But what his concern was is that uh, opportunities to preach the gospel. You know, he preached the gospel. I use the word preach. He explained the gospel. He shared the gospel with people while he was in house arrest. So he had a ministry, but it was greatly curtailed from what he would normally have been doing. So he's asking the people to pray that God will open up to us a door, an opportunity to uh, for, for the word. The word has to do with the saving message of Christ. Someone has said this, and I don't have the reference to who said that, in every circumstance, pray not for release, but for conquest. In every circumstance, pray not for release, but for conquest. God has you in the circumstances you're in. And he wants to use you in those circumstances. He's not wanting to deliver you from them. He wants you to be more than a conqueror in the midst of your circumstances. <clears throat> Easier said than done. We certainly need to depend upon God's grace to enable us to live that way and pray that way. And the purpose of his request is verse going on so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ. That's what he's been talking about in the book of Colossians, the mystery of Christ. Now, the Old Testament promised and predicted the coming of the Messiah, but the Old Testament never said anything about the church which would be made up of Jews and Gentiles united together in one body called the church, the body of Christ. That was a mystery. It had not been revealed in the past, and the Apostle Paul was the one that God chose to reveal that mystery to Gentiles in this age. 
So God opens doors of opportunity for us. That's divine sovereignty. He's involved in evangelism. He opens doors. He gives us opportunities. So your car breaks down on the highway and you're towed to a nearby town and you don't know anybody there and you're watching the mechanic work on your car and you begin a conversation and before you know it, you're witnessing to him about Jesus Christ. An opportunity that God provided. <clears throat> Last Sunday, we stopped at um, McDonald's to get a cup of coffee on the way home, which we often do, almost always do. They have good coffee for a little bit of money. And there was a man standing there that looked kind of lost, and I was having my coffee. Bonnie was walking the dog, and I, I said, uh, you must be a painter. He says, yes. How did you know? I said, well, I'm kind of looking at the way you dress. Anyway, he just, he came right over to me and started talking. He talked about his dad. He talked about his life. He talked about his kid. He, he just talked. I thought, wow, this guy really opened up to me. He, and I had given him some advice about, you know, hang in there and persevere and you can do it and all this. And he, he, when, when I left, he says, he gave me good fatherly advice. <laughs> I mean, the man was probably 60 years old. His kids were grown. But you know what? Nothing came of that, but he could have. Something could have come of that. But everybody nowadays, you know, they're, they're working on their little things so they don't have to talk to anybody or look at anybody. Or I think a Christian needs to think, you know what? When I'm in public, I need to have my eyes open and I need to be aware of opportunities that God sends my way. Um, I have another illustration, but I, I gotta get through this, so I, I better not stop with that illustration. It came to my mind just now. So the Apostle Paul wanted an opportunity to speak the mystery of Christ. Okay? The gospel of Jesus Christ. Christ himself. God opened the door, or opens doors, but we must do the speaking. Evangelism is our responsibility. God does not do the evangelizing. We do. God does not speak the mystery of Christ. We do. So that's our responsibility. He says, this is the, the message for which I have also been in prison. In verse 4. Another reason why he made this request, that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. The mystery of Christ that I might make it clear, um, a thorough and logical explanation. Paul realized he needed their prayers for his ministry to be effective, and they had the responsibility to pray that he would make the gospel clear. Many people have bits and pieces of the gospel they've heard all their lives in different places, but it's not clear. It's a little bit here, a little piece there, but it's not coherent, it's not logical, it doesn't lead to a conclusion. You talk to anybody and they have some idea about the gospel, some idea about Christ. But it's all jangled up because it, it hasn't been presented in a logical and a thorough way. In Ephesians 6.19, the Apostle Paul wrote this, that he asked his prayer request is to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. So clarity and boldness are two things the Apostle Paul asked the church to pray for. <clears throat> boldness means freedom of speech, that we're not intimidated by others, that we're able to speak very freely about Christ, about the gospel. And clarity means that we don't just give uh, a half, uh, um, we don't just talk about sin, we don't talk about heaven and, and hell. We give the whole story of Jesus Christ, why he came, who he is, what he did, why we can be saved by faith in him. Make it clear. That's our responsibility. And the Apostle Paul asked the church to pray for him that he might fulfill that responsibility. Then in verse 5, he says, Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, outsiders to be unbelievers, those outside the church. In dealing with a secular society, believers are to be cautious 
and tactful so as to avoid needless antagonizing of people. Don't need needlessly antagonize people. Now, I'm sure most of you have been in big cities where you were walking downtown and there was a street preacher on the corner. And boy, oh boy, was he going and condemning everybody to hell and telling everybody to repent. And he would read and it just grates on me. There's no grace. There's no wisdom. It's just somebody showing off that he's better than everybody else. If, if, if I tell you what, I would, I would never see a drunk person on the sidewalk and see a street preacher. Because so many people walk by and shake their heads. What? what an, and that is the picture of Christianity that many people have. That's not the gospel. That's not making the mystery of Christ clear. Nobody is saved because they're told that they're going to go to hell for their sin. That's not the good news. But that's the message you get from these street preachers. And I've seen a lot of them growing up in L.A. and living here in San Francisco. But I mean, uh, conduct yourselves with wisdom. In other words, our actions must support our words. We are called on to live in such a way that we establish the credibility of the Christian faith. That people, even if, even if we don't lead them to Christ, they have a good impression of the Christian faith because of the way we conduct ourselves. <clears throat> I think we have we need wisdom. Wisdom comes from God. If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. Who gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not. So we need to ask God because we don't automatically have the right, know exactly how to approach the situation. Making the most of the opportunity. King James says redeeming the time. And the word redeeming means to buy up. And the time here is not chronos, having to do with time, it has to do with opportunity, it has to do with the season, the proper, the, the opportune time is what it's talking about. So making the most of the opportunity, taking advantage of every opportunity, every door that God opens, taking full advantage of that opportunity. Remember Jesus was alone, the disciples had gone into Sychar to buy food, and he was alone at, the, at Jacob's well. And a, a Sarah American woman came and she was alone. And they had a conversation. And uh, that was an opportune time. To have this woman alone and have Jesus there, this was an opportunity. Nobody around to disturb or to ask questions or interrupt. I, I uh, I've often prayed for opportunities like that. Um, <clears throat> and when I get to heaven, I'm sure there's going to be a whole storehouse of opportunities that I never took advantage of. Angels going to open up the door and say, these are all the opportunities God gave you to win, so you didn't do it. But I think we should pray about those things, pray about those opportunities, Maybe the first time we don't have a chance to talk to somebody because they're busy, maybe we just give them a track. Maybe we just tell them that we'd like to talk to them in the future. But we, we make some kind of a connection with that person. And then when we see them again, we can build on that. Let your speech, he says, always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt. Jesus, it says, was full of grace and truth. Those are the two things that every one of us needed. We needed grace and we needed truth. And we needed somebody to convey the message that we needed to hear with grace. How many of you came to Christ because you felt, well, I'm going to go to hell if I don't change my ways? That's religion. That's not the good news. That's not the gospel. What we need to hear is that God loves you. That Christ gave his life for you. He paid the penalty of sin for you. And he all simply asked you to believe in him for eternal life. Not a hard-hitting 
Hold the pounding messages. Something you can share with a little child. Let your speech always be with grace. Salt is used as a metaphor here for charm and wit. Wit is the ability to say just the right thing at the right time. Wouldn't you love to have wit? Well, God will give us wit. He opens doors. We are to take advantage of the opportunity and then we're to ask God for the wisdom that we need to conduct ourselves to say the right thing at the right time in the right way to people. We can say the wrong thing and have good motives and people are turned off and they turn away from us. We can say the right thing in the right motive at the right time and they can turn away from us. But our responsibility is not whether they turn away from us, it's whether or not we approach the situation wisely so that we might know how to respond to each person in order that we might adopt the message, adapt the message to the situation and speak appropriately to each person. <clears throat> the Philippian jailer said, what must I do to be saved? Paul says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you should be saved. The woman at the well, <clears throat> um, or excuse me, in Acts 8, 40, 34, the, the, the Ethiopian eunuch was in his chariot and he was reading Isaiah 53 and he didn't understand what was going on there so God brought Philip to him and he says Philip says what are you reading? He says I'm reading the prophet Isaiah well do you understand what you're reading? How can I understand without somebody to help me to teach me? And so beginning at Isaiah 53 Philip preached unto him Jesus there's a totally different approach here's a person reading his Bible He's a proselyte of Judaism, but he doesn't understand what Isaiah 53 is talking about. And so, Philip explains it to him. Nicodemus needed to be born again, and he didn't even understand what the new birth was all about. The woman at the well um, needed to know who Jesus was. He, he, he said, if you knew who you were speaking to, you would have asked him, and he would have given you eternal life, or living life. Different approaches for different situations and different people and different backgrounds. Totally different. Jesus offered the woman at the well eternal life without ever telling her that she needed to repent of her immoral lifestyle. He never brought it up. The only reason he said that is so that she would realize that he was a prophet because he knew her life. He knew her past. He knew what she was doing right now. And that got him, her thinking, you must be a prophet. What she didn't know is who was Jesus? She was looking for the Messiah. She didn't know Jesus was the Messiah. That's what she needed to hear. Every single time we have the gospel being presented, in unique situations, in a unique way, it is not ever a canned approach. Never a canned approach. It's an insult to anybody's personal experience or intelligence if you think that one size fits all and you, you, you tell a child and you tell a little person the same thing, the same four spiritual laws or whatever, three steps to peace with God, whatever the tract says, that is not communicating graciously and wisely. Ask people questions. Find out what their background is. Find out what their problem is. Why don't you go to church anymore? You were baptized, why were you baptized? What did you believe at that time? All of these things are conversations that get us closer to understanding what they need to hear. I remember talking to a person <clears throat> that I was witnessing to, and he told me quite frankly, he said, you know what? I don't think God can forgive me. I've done too many bad things. What does he need to hear? He needs to hear about how God can forgive. How Jesus paid the penalty for that sin. He's not going to condemn you for it. What you need to do is, is accept his sacrifice in your behalf. Well, really? I can be forgiven? Yeah. It doesn't matter what you've done. You can be forgiven. That's what he needs to hear. Everybody is different. Everybody is unique. So we need to treat that everybody with, with that way. And 1 Peter, if you turn over to 1 Peter, there's a great 
statement that he makes. 1 Peter 3.15, let me read that for you. <clears throat> 1 Peter 3.15, verse 13, because that's where the actual uh, paragraph begins. Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled. But sanctify that is set apart Christ the Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to anyone, to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. Yet, how to do it? With gentleness or meekness and reverence. Gentleness and reverence. That's not the street they preachers of style at all. Gentleness and reverence. Respect the person. I don't care if he's a derelict. Respect him. He's a human being. Made in the image of God. Show him respect. Show him grace. I have a statement that I wrote down, but I don't know if I even gave, gave you that yet. But, but we, we are to convey a, a gracious attitude when we speak to people who are lost. Not a condemning attitude. Not a self-righteous attitude. Not a religious piety attitude. They're not going to hell because they don't go to church. They're not going to hell because they've committed too many bad sins. They're not going to hell unless they reject the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that needs to be made clear to them. God wants to save them. He made every provision for their salvation. He wants them to be in, in heaven with Him in eternity. That's what they need to hear. God loves you. Now let's go to verse 7. As to all my affairs, and, and this, if you, if you notice on the outline, uh, we have our personal responsibilities in evangelism, but we also need the support of fellow Christians. And that's what this section is, uh, that, that's what the way I, um, I look at this section. As to all my affairs, Paul is in house arrest in Rome. He's been in Rome, he's been in house arrest for two, two years of his four years there, chained to a Roman guard 24-7. He says he wants the church in Colossae to know about his affairs. Tychicus, an intimate friend of Paul who journeyed with him on this third missionary journey, and who probably delivered this letter to the church in Colossae along with Paul's letter to the Ephesians and to Philemon. So Tychicus was uh, a liaison between Paul and churches and very important for Paul's ministry. He says, our beloved brother and faithful servant and fellow bond servant of the Lord. <clears throat> so he served with Paul as his trusted assistant. He was trustworthy. He was reliable. And he served the Lord out of love. Will bring you information. For I have sent him to you for this very purpose that you may know about our circumstances. Why do they need to know about their circumstances? Well, how can you pray for somebody if you don't know what they're going through? If you don't know what their needs are? See, I'll tell you something. I've been around for a long time. I've been in the ministry 45 years. And it didn't used to be this way in the generation previous to me, but the prayer meeting has shrunk and shrunk and shrunk. And now it's basically a Bible study with a few prayers. And you know why? Because people don't know each other. They don't know how to pray for each other. If we knew each other better, if we spent time praying for each other, God would do a lot more things in our church and in our community through our church. Charles Haddon Spurgeon realized the importance of prayer. He had Spurgeon's Tabernacle in London, seven seated 7,000 people. And he filled it day after day after day. Two young seminarians were told by the professor, before you go out into the countryside and pastor a church, you need to go to the Spurgeon's Tabernacle and you need to see what he does. 
Well, they got there early, and it was August, and um, they were sitting there, and this man comes to a big man with a beard, and he comes and he introduces, he doesn't introduce himself, he asks him, what are you here for? Well, we came to hear the great Spurgeon. He says, well, let me, let me show you something. I'm gonna, let me show you the church's eating apparatus. He thought, August, eating apparatus? So they followed him down into the basement. He opened the double doors and 300 people were praying for the service that was about to begin. 300 people praying. And Spurgeon said, there's the church's eating apparatus. That's what makes it work. That's what makes it work. If every person in this church were to pray to God Sunday morning that you got up and you had breakfast and you fervently pray that God would speak to you and speak to others through the ministry of the pulpit of this church, I think every preacher you have here would do a lot better. Be a much more effective preacher. I told my deacons that story when I was in Livermore, Bethany Baptist Church in Livermore. <clears throat> and I said, uh, I was very impressed with this. And so I told him, I said, you know what? We, on Wednesday night, we pray for, you know, Aunt Nellie's bursitis and everything under the sun. That's fine. But I said, Sunday morning, I want to get together with my men and let's just pray for the service today. Pray for the Sunday school and, and for the morning service. And nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing personal. Just pray for that. And after a couple of months, I got feedback from him. And one guy told me, he says, well, he says, I don't know if uh, God's answering my prayer for anybody else, but I know I'm getting a lot more out of the service. It, prayer is an obligation that we have. If God's going to open doors, if God's going to enable people to speak clearly and boldly the gospel and be effective in their ministry, they need to have prayers from other people. Verse 8, <clears throat> For I have sent him to you for this very purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. The word encourage, <clears throat> parakaleo, call alongside. One of my favorite verses in Romans 15, 4, where it says, whatever was written aforetime, Old Testament, was written for our instruction that we through the comfort of scriptures might have hope. The encouragement of the scriptures gives us hope. So when we talk about what God has done in the past, in people's lives, how he has answered people's prayers, that encourages us. We realize, you know, God's in control. Paul's in prison, and we wish he weren't, and we're praying for him. How should we pray? And Tychicus comes back and says, this is how you... This is his situation, so you know exactly what he's going through and how you need to pray for him. But he encourages them. He reminds them of God's promises and provision in the scriptures. Verse 9. And with him, Onesimus. Now, Onesimus was the runaway slave that was saved when he met up with the Apostle Paul by chance, right? God opened the door. He was saved through the ministry of Paul who sent him back to the slave owner, Philemon, with a letter that bears his name, the epistle of Philemon. How many of you remember me preaching Philemon? There are two of them. <laughs> what did I title that message? The grace of forgiveness. Forgive. He's, he's writing to a godly man and says, you know what? Your slave ran away, that's a bad thing, but he got saved, now he's a beloved brother, and I'm sending him back to you, and I want you to forget. So, Onesimus accompanied Tychicus uh, to take these letters that Paul wrote to the different churches. They will inform you, Onesimus and Tychicus will inform you uh, about the whole situation here. When we share prayer requests, one of the things that we're really doing is basically informing people what the situation is. We're not telling them how to pray. We're not telling them specifically what to pray for. Although Paul did ask that he would be able to speak clearly and boldly. So sometimes we do ask them specific requests. 
But you don't have to know what God, God's will is. You just have, this is the situation. This is the situation. When my brother was in Vietnam, my folks were going to the Evangelical Free Church in Orwell. <clears throat> and Mrs. Wyckoff, anybody know Mrs. Wyckoff? An old lady. They showed up one time, and she showed up at church, and she asked Mom, how's Glenn doing? And uh, that, this is the, during the Tet Offensive. And uh, shells were falling on where they were. He was in, in grave danger. And, this is why, and Mom said, why? Well, she said, I woke up in the middle of the night last night, and I couldn't. Glenn was on my mind, and I kept thinking about it. And I prayed for him. That's what you do when you keep thinking about somebody. Pray for him. And uh, anyway, we found out a few days later that he was involved in the head of things. And that his wife was in danger. She prayed. Okay. God can put it on our hearts to pray for somebody for some situation that we're not even aware is going on. God can prompt us to pray. Sometimes we don't know why we're praying for a situation. We just know that we have that, that a sense that God has given us that we need to pray. It's a wonderful thing, especially when we find out how He answered our prayer. Um, they will inform you about the whole situation here. Now, verse ten, Aristarchus. That's Aristarchus, right? My fellow prisoner. Now, Aristarchus apparently was in Paul's ministry and, and uh, followed the Apostle Paul, helped him out, and he actually stayed with Paul while Paul was in prison in Rome. He sends you greeting. So he's a fellow prisoner. Now, our Aristarchus is a Gentile name, but he was a Jew. And we'll see that in verse 11. Um, the Apostle's great warmth and appreciation for his beloved co-workers comes through and should remind us that all, we all need the support of each other. So he had Tychicus, he had Onesimus, he had Aristarchus, who was with him, a Jew from Thessalonica who remained with Paul even while he was in prison. And also Barnabas' cousin, Mark, who wrote the Gospel of Mark, by the way, and who also abandoned Paul on his first missionary journey, and when he wanted to go with Paul on the second missionary journey, said, no way, I have to have somebody I can count on. But he says, also Barnabas' cousin, Paul, about whom you received instructions, if he comes to you, welcome him. So apparently the falling out that they had had been remedied and been reconciled and later on um, he was referred to in Acts 15 as the Apostle Paul says he is a useful, he is useful to me for service. In, in 2 Timothy 4.11 he says that. So the two have been reconciled and so you know what? It's so unusual, but it is so Christianity-like, it's so God-like for people who had a falling out with each other to reconcile and not hold that against them and see them develop and be used of God. Mark wrote the Gospel of Mark in the Bible. And yet he failed. And yet Paul forgave him. And you know that forgiveness could have been the impetus that he needed to go on and serve the Lord and even write the Gospel of Mark. Verse 11, and also Jesus who is called Justice. Now Jesus was a common name. That's why you often refer hear that in the New Testament, Jesus of Nazareth, Mary of Magdala, Mary Magdalene. In other words, that they only had first names and they had to identify which one they were talking about by where they were who their parents were or where they were born and raised. He was raised in Nazareth, Jesus of Nazareth. Here's another Jesus who had another name called Justice. And we don't know a thing about Justice. 
Not a thing. But he says, these are the only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are from the circumcision. Aristarchus, Mark, and Justus, the only three who are from the circumcision, that is, who are Jews, that worked along with Paul for the kingdom of God. Paul felt keenly his alienation from his fellow Jews. Some of you have family members that you feel keenly the alienation that has come about as a result of your faith in Christ, and they don't have it. Listen to what Paul says in, chapter, in, in Romans, chapter 9. This is what Paul, how he prayed for those people that he loved that hadn't come to Christ. He says, I can wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom belongs the adoption of sons and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple service and the promises. I am telling you the truth. I am not lying. My conscience, testify, conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. Why? For I can wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. So here in Colossians 3.11, 4.11, he says these three, Aristarchus, verse 10, Mark, verse 10, and Justice, in verse 11. These are the only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are from the circumstances. Becoming a Christian can be a very lonely thing. I have known lots of people who are the only person in their family, the only person in their family that believed in Christ. That's a lonely thing. We need to come alongside of those people. We need to encourage those people. We need to befriend those people. We need to say, you know what? I don't know how you do it, but if, if nobody in my family was a believer, that would be really tough for me emotionally. met a lot of people like that. Nobody in their family. Whereas I can go back to grandparents on both sides and great grandparents. Wow. He has nobody. In fact, somebody said that these may have been people that were, uh, that he's talking about, that, that were actually cousins or members of his, his family, his relatives. And they, uh, and, uh, and they have proved to be an encouragement to me. Have you proved to be an encouragement to anybody? You probably have and don't even know it. But when you're positive, when you have strong faith, when you experience confidence and have courage, other people are encouraged by that. When Samson defeated, Samson, when, De when David defeated Goliath, all the people of Israel were encouraged. They shouted for joy. They were encouraged. God gave them a great victory. Now the word encouragement here in verse 11 is a different word from a, the word encouragement in verse 8. Um, it means to give relief, to comfort, to lessen pain. Perhaps in a particular time of crisis, these three Jews stood by Paul. So important. You know, Billy Graham, I followed his career all of my life. But he had two men that stood with him through everything. Two men. They were a unit, an inseparable unit. Probably has never been seen in, in, in our lifetimes that kind of a, a relationship, a commitment, and an encouragement to each other. Now we're all in heaven together. Verse 12, the Epaphras, who is one of your number, a bond slave of Jesus Christ. He is mentioned in chapter 1, verse 7, as the founder of the Colossian church. Remember, Paul did not establish his church, but he was Paul's representative there. He sends you his greetings, always laboring earnestly for you in his prayers. The word laboring literally is agon, agonize. NIV translates it wrestling. 
He was a prayer warrior. Always praying for this church. In his prayers. Refers to prolonged, intense prayer. Not formal or casual prayer. Now, let me just make sure I make this very clear. There's nothing wrong with a formal or a casual prayer. When I pray at the dinner table, I pretty much say the same things. And when I pray at church, I, many times at communion or different times, I pray pretty much the same thing. And we, we just have to realize that we need to be aware of what's going on and what we're praying for, and we're not just going through the words. I remember going as a kid to Texas and seeing my cousins, and I remember Grandpapa Secrets, my mom's dad, would pray. Been a Methodist all of his life. Same prayer every single meal. Same words. Same length. Same voice inflections. I just had a recording. That's not good. Not good. So sometimes we do get into that rut, and it's not necessarily a sin because we may be thoroughly thinking and believing and it may be absolutely what we really are want. And we can all, always fall into that rut of just saying the same thing over and over without thinking about it. Now it says here, he's striving for you in his prayers. Why? That you may stand perfect and fully assured in all the will of God. Paul had in mind the possibility of their wavering under the influence of the Gnostic heresy in Colossae. That's what he wrote this book for. That's what this, the book of Colossians is about. is fortifying the church against this heresy of, of Gnosticism, in which Christ is in Korean. And to be as surely, uh, fully assured in the will of, in everything, in the will of God uh, is... Uh, uh, let, let me go back. The word perfect means spiritual maturity and stability. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13. This is, this is the opposite of perfect. This is the opposite. He says this in 4.13 of Ephesians. He says, Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, what is this mature, this mature man? As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. So, what um, Epaphras, their pastor, is praying for the church so fervently is that they might be brought to spiritual maturity so they would be stable in their faith and they would not be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. The word perfect is not talking about absolute perfection or sinless perfection. It's talking about maturity, stability, not being children tossed to and fro. Verse 13, For I testify for him that he, is, he has a deep concern. The Catholics had a deep concern for you and for those who are in Laodicea and Hierapolis, <clears throat> which were cities close by. Luke, the beloved physician, this is where we find out that Luke was actually a physician. He was a historian and he was a physician. He wrote the Gospel of Luke and he wrote the Book of Acts. He sends you his greetings and also Demas. Demas he called in Philemon, my fellow worker. He later abandoned the Apostle Paul. Demas, he says, having loved this present world, has abandoned And uh, And yet here, he, he refers to him and says, he greets you. Verse 15, greet the brethren who are in Laodicea and also Nympha and the church that is in her house. I heard Dr. McGee, you know, his through the Bible radio goes on and on and on. He's been dead for a long time. But in that thing that I was listening to, he made the statement that he thought the day would come in America 
when people would be back in house churches. And we know the hostility of our culture against Christianity, and it's uh, going to be harder and harder for people to buy property and to build churches and so forth. And that's what he. Well, anyway, it started out that way. For two centuries, the churches met in homes. When this letter is read among you, so Paul intended for the whole congregation to have this letter read to them, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and you, for your part, read my letter that is coming from Laodicea. Say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord that you may fulfill it. Keep your eye on it, complete it. It's very easy for people to give up, get discouraged, and get and, and leave the ministry. I've met so many people and left the ministry. Um, I call, verse 18, write this greeting with my own hand. He did this as a sign of authenticity. He didn't he dictated the letter, all of his letters, because he couldn't see well enough to write them, but he always signed his own name to the end of it as um, authenticity. Remember my imprisonment. It's all he says about himself in his own circumstances. Just remember me. Don't forget me. Remember that I'm here. Just remember my prison. Not telling them what to pray. Just remember me. And then he says, grace be with you. God is able to make all grace abound toward you that always having all sufficiency in all things, you may abound in every good work. And so when we pray for grace for somebody, we're praying for divine enablement, for them to do everything that God wants them to do. Wonderful provision. People like to talk about the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit. You've got the grace of God which gives you everything you need for every work that God wants you to perform. He is able to make all grace abound for you. That always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Don't exalt the Holy Spirit. Don't make the Holy Spirit the Lord. It says sanctify Christ. Set, apart, set Christ apart as Lord in your hearts. For you know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he, he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Exalt Christ. Talk about Christ. Talk about what Christ has done. Because whenever you talk about what the Holy Spirit does in your life, it's always subjective. Nobody can verify it. Nobody can, well, nobody can verify it from the Scriptures. Nobody. It's totally subjective. Well, the Holy Spirit told me to do this. Well, how do I know that? I say, the Billy Grant says, the Bible says, the Bible says. That's why I do what I do. I read the map, and I follow the map. I don't go by instinct. I don't go by emotions. I don't go by how I feel. I don't go by some spiritual impression. I go by what the Bible says. If I can't find it in the Bible, if I can't show you from the Bible, I have no authority at all for what I'm doing. Heavenly I mean, Father, <clears throat> evangelism, personal evangelism is such an important subject. And yet we always want to pay somebody else to do our evangelistic work. We'll send a missionary and send them money. We'll pray for an evangelist and send them money. But our personal responsibility for evangelism is often overlooked. We need to pray about it all the time. We need to be aware of opportunities that you bring our way. And then we need to speak clearly, graciously, boldly, appropriate to every person's situation that you might use us to bring people to faith in Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen.